All right. How are you guys doing, movie lovers? Uh, my name is Luis Martinez, and I'm a collaborator of the San Diego Latino Film Festival here in its 27th year um, in a virtual edition this year, obviously. And this is a Q&A for the film that you may have just watched called Jose Lezama Lima Letters to Eloisa which is a documentary directed by Adriana Bosch, who's going to join us here today in a second. And... Hi. Hey, Adriana. How are you doing today? I'm good, Luis. Thank you for having me. I really, you know, was very happy to participate in this documentary. Of course, I look forward to going over to San Diego and being over <laughs> you know, circumstances are what they are. The the thing that mo that the filmmakers are missing out the most on is the sabor Latino part of the festival. <laughs> <laughs> the free Stella, the free beers and the uh, and the and the parties, you know. I know, I, mean? I know. I mean, it's just, you know, but we're thank you for for holding it virtual. I know that it is uh, quite a quite a task to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a and and obviously, thank you for 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 bringing and allowing uh, us to screen your your film virtually. I, I've been watching it. Um, I watched a few parts over and over over the last couple of days, just in preparation for this. You said before we came on line that you had kind of want, done one of these for uh, for Boston Latino Film Festival. This yes, morning. the Q and A. Yes, yes, I had with uh, that was done with an expert on on the writer on Jose Le Samalima. So it had a, uh, the content was, you know, much, a, a lot more about the literature and about the theme, the, the content of the film than the film is itself. And uh, it, it was quite enjoyable. I, you know, filmmakers, as you know, we always have a hell of a lot more to say or we think we do right. than what we put on the screen. So it's like you push, the, you push a button, you know? So I'll try to keep it short and, uh, and have a good time with you. No, yeah. no, it's fine. We got, we got, we got all the time that we need. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the festival run. How has the film been received? How many festivals have you been in so far? How's that been going for you? Well, I, I've been now. This is my sixth festival. The first one was the Miami International Film Festival. We, you know, we had an amazing reception. Uh, you know, of course, that's you know, this is the film's hometown, and we actually tied for the Audience Achievement Award. Although this year they only gave one award and uh, it was to another film. So that was kind of a bit disappointing, but other than that, uh, it's, it's been, um, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting time. I think festivals have narrowed the number of films they're handling because of the circumstances. And I, you know, my only regret really is that this film was made in a sense, um, it, 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 it's emotional content was made to be shared. I, I think my, my vision of this film was to have always to have a, a house full of people, the theater, and that they would share in the experience uh, with one another and generate that wonderful, um, you know, ping ping repercussion of, of, of emotion that takes place in a, in a, social, in a social setting. Um, but, you know, I, I again, I'm, I'm really happy to to have seen the film shown in as many festivals as cities as it has been shown. And now I'm waiting for the next um, round. There'll be a few more that I've applied to and uh, um, there'll be some others in 2020, uh, to, you know, for the 2020 season that I, you know, because this, this it, it premiered in March. So the cycle won't, won't close until next spring. So that's the long answer to what could be. <laughs> No, I've always said that, that 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 the two of the most gratifying experiences for any filmmaker are day one, shot one, you right. know, because that's just like the feeling of all the pre-production work coming to yeah. fruition, and and then also sitting in the back of an audience and watching a crowd's reaction to what you're doing. Oh yeah, it's it, yes, yes, it's it's uh, it's it, and at the end of the film, if if you have that sort of you know, I, I usually hang in the front to the side. I, I go, you know, I, I sort of walk the hallways and uh, in the theaters and, and you can, you know, I like to have the audience behind me. I don't want to, you know, kind of watch because then you get too anxious. But that sort of little moment between the time where the credit roll finishes and you, you just have a few 
moments there before the audience reaction really comes forth. And then it there, you know, it, it's priceless. I think we make a lot of sacrifices, particularly in documentaries. You know, documentaries take a lot of work and a lot of effort, and they're always, um, you know, it, it's it's a difficult medium. It's a difficult medium, and to 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 you know to convey emotion and and uh, you're always nervous that your film is only important to you. And once your audience, you have a wonderful reaction from the audience, it, it kind of, you know, it rewards you for everything that you have done. And, and I, you know, that's... For, yeah. for, for, for me, it's usually because we do a lot of comedies, it's laughing or, oh, having, yeah. them, or right. having them laugh at the right time. As a, document, as a documentarian, you're looking for more of like... You're looking um, for applause, man. You're, you're looking for applause. And you're looking for... In this case, what happened was since the film premiered here in Miami, uh, there were a lot of tears. I mean, there were people who were really, really, the theater was, everybody was crying. And I, I think there was a mixture of nostalgia, of recognition, and just seeing, you know, I think in a way, for all of us Latinos, I think that is true. I, I had the same sense when I, you know, when I when I premiered a film about Latin music in Puerto Rico, where there were lots of Puerto Ricans, there were Mark Anthony, there was India, there was, you know, um, Ricky Martin, there were all of the Puerto Ricans that had made that fourth wave of of that that, that Latino wave in, 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 in at the turn of the century. And people were people, it was like the second coming. This recognition that comes from seeing yourself, your culture, your thing proje projected with the same attention to details and production values that you associate with other people, you know? And, and, I, and I think it's a wonderful recognition for, for us and a wonderful validation. And I live for that. I live to validate my culture. I live to validate Latino culture. And I live to validate the importance of storytelling. And when that's validated, it, it, it's just, there's no substitute. All right, here's uh, uh, our founder here, Mr. Vantillo says, thank you, Adriana, for showing your movie in San Diego. Thank you very, very much for for, for you know having this movie in, in, in the San Diego Film Festival, absolutely. There's a lot of, diff there's, a, there's obviously marked differences between narrative and, and documentary filmmaking. Um, obviously, in, in as much as if it's a documentary that's about an ongoing subject affecting your subjects as you document them. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there's a lot of uh, recreations. There's a lot of uh, footage. You made a lot of decisions, you know, in, in the best way to tell the stories. One of the first ones that sort of stood out to me was the choice to have the letters recited in English. Yes. Yes. Um, what went into that? Is that to give it a broader audience or what was your thought process there? It, well, yes, I think absolutely. And I also, it was to give it, a, th th there was so much Spanish already in the film because of his words, because of the interviewees that I felt I had reached that tipping point where I was going to be a Spanish language film. And that would not cover a lot of the, the general audience speak Spanish, I mean, English speaking, but also a lot of Latinos that are not, you know, that are not Spanish speaking audience. I wanted my film to be an American film. And I mean, a, a, in a way, a Latino film, you know, which right. is ultimately an American film. Right. And so that's, I think the decision was made in that direction. I wanted to, to universalize the film. I didn't want to be locked up in a little bit Cuban bubble, having a Cuban right. leader, a Cuban actor, and I, I wanted to, to open it up. At the same time, I wanted a voice that, and, and this is always true for the choice I make when I have a narrator or, or I want somebody that can authentically project our tone, our timber, you know, our, our way of rapping. There, there is a way in which we speak that even though if it, it could be not in my case, but in the case of many second, third generation Latinos, it is totally acceptless. But there is always a quality, I think, to the voice and to the delivery that speaks Latino. And I always wanted to have that have that in my films. You know. So when when you're when you're making those decisions, you know, weighing, you know, how to how to how to tell the story to the audience, do you um 
do you ever feel do you ever feel that a, a documentary because i mean for myself a narrative film there's there's a time where you get the cut that it's just right is it ever finished for you because i'm assuming yeah. if you if you had an extra 20 hours to edit you'd take another extra 20 hours no, to edit, I have right? 20 hours to edit and i'm going <laughs> to and uh, it's uh, i have to do this film is as i call it the festival version there has to be now a pbs version that is going to be 8 minutes shorter and oh. probably a little more tvish a little less, you know, you have to, in order to do that, there is going to be some compression. So there might have to be a little more, I don't wanna see, have too much narration. My original intention to have was to have a non-narrated film, but there was so much to explain around the figure that people didn't know and about a piece of Cuban history that people were unfamiliar with. And so that kind of forced me to have to make some decisions that I hope don't come through as didactic, but in a way that needed to explain the con explain the context and explain what was happening around the story I was trying to tell, and also set up my character. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I have some here. Set up my character in a way that familiarized you with him and his literature, because part of the documentary part of what the documentary tells you is that he was at a, he was obscured as a writer he was a writer that had you know was a very famous very well known and then because of political issues and the way the course of history uh, the, the course that history took uh, was obscure and i needed to drag him out of that relative obscurity and you know, and and bring him to to the audience, so that created, um, you know, that that created an issue. You say you you're going to make a film about Garcia Marquez. You already have a lot of assumptions that the audience brings onto the film and knowledge, and you can work with that. When you do a film about Jose Luis Amalima, whose literary stature maybe is not you know as high, but pretty much in the same pantheon. As a Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and you don't know anything about him, that puts extra weight on 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 the uh, on the film to to explain who he was, what he did, what his contribution was, and a lot of a lot of that information. I think that you know, obviously, you know, I'm I'm Colombian, so you grow up and you and like you said, Gabriel oh, yeah. Garcia Marquez is this is this giant figure, and then you're like, well, what are the quintessential Latino books that you should read, and you know, yeah. like the great work. So you have like Cien Años de Soledad, you know, Soledad, Martin Fierro, Paradiso. You know, there's there's a lot of there's they, they you know you know the book in sort of like this 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 feed this this thought of knowing that it's out there in the ether and that it's an important piece of work. But this film really puts it into context, not only in how important he was as, you know, but but it, but how his life went from being, you know, celebrated to hidden, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. I, and I, I think it's, um, you know, it, in its essence, it's a Cuban story, but it isn't. I mean, it's a story, I think, that you can draw to, you know, to draw out to a lot of writers and a lot of places where, politics and literature mesh. And I think that you are a Colombian, I am a Cuban. I think we all let, you know, we all know that we have governments from the right and from the left that um, that that for, for whom culture and literature and what people of that stature say becomes very important because we value our literary figures are public figures. Our literary figures are not kind of, you know, uh, novelists. We have a connection between literature and politics that is very strong. So it is important for a lot of these governments, especially if they tend to be totalitarian or if they or revolutionary, however you want to call it, that where they need the voices of these writers for legitimacy, not only for themselves, but but abroad. And I think um, our writers, our intellectuals have a weight in society that I think it's not something that um, you see as much in, certainly not in the United States. You may see it in the in French culture when you have the Jean-Paul Sartre and, you know, and people like that, that become cultural icons. 
but uh, and have great political influence. But for us, as you know, you know, when Garcia Marquez spoke, when Vargas Llosa spoke, you know, Carlos Fuente, uh, you, you know, you name them, and, and they, Jorge Luis Borges, our literary figures are enormous and, and enormously influential with, with people. I, th I think also, you know, just if you look at somebody like uh, like a Hunter Thompson or a Walt Whitman, these these writers that are American that, that get to tell their story, they get to basically speak freely, have these very poetic ways of, of talking about you know mundane situations in real life. But they never had the issue of a government, their own government you know, trying to basically erase them from the libraries, Right. you know, they, so, you know, so like you said, Latin writers don't have that. F they have the freedom at some, at a time, but, but in the same way, they also have, like you said, this weight behind them and that's kind of hovering over them. Right. And, 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 you know, I think that you have a lot of this is, is more present in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Russian history, in the, in the, in the history of not just the Soviet Union, but Russian letters. And you have that kind of, um, you know, that kind of history of writers being, you know, being erased from from the public eye, or that tension between intellectuals and and, and government. You know, art and politics is very present in a lot of uh, in a lot of cultures, not in American culture as much. But I'm not saying that it is absent. But you you don't. Writers don't occupy the public square, if you may, the way that they do in our in our culture. I mean, our, our you know writers, government govern governments need the support of these the right. intellectuals, and they're either in the opposition or they are, and they are asked, I think, by people to take to take a stance. And rarely do you have somebody like Osele Samalima. Who basically, you know, try desperately to step away from taking a political stand, but politics came at him, and in the in the end, that was not possible. What he wanted to do, which was stand above politics and construct whatever it is he wanted to construct, the nation based on culture and literature and art, divorced from the politics of 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 of, of Cuba, uh, you know was not possible um you know after the after the revolution when everything became you know was either and, and and castro said it you know against the revolution you know there is no there is no freedom there is nothing uh, i know that I know that you uh, you've done previously a documentary about uh, or story about Fidel Castro uh, as well. Yeah. Did did um, did you when you knew you wanted to tell stories, be a filmmaker, have this um, this story as something that you knew you eventually wanted to tell, or is some it was it something that that came to you you know after you, after you've already been uh, making movies for a while? Well, I started my uh, my movie career you know, my, my documentary career as an academic. I, I, I was um, an editorial consultant on a film about Central America and then on a film about Mexico and then on a film about Latin America, on a series about Latin America. And eventually I became, you know, I drifted into production because I felt documentaries had a way to convey um, very complex realities and very complex human emotions in a way that books didn't uh, in, in and, and 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 could reach a lot more people that than than you would in a book and certainly academic articles and all that um, are very important and sustain the work of documentarians but the idea of having a human voice of having a human experience of having somebody there has no I, I think that's you know a picture is worth a thousand words and um <clears throat> So no, I, I, so that's where I started. And so I always began with an emphasis and a focus on Latin American stories, not just Cuban stories, but Latin American stories. And then I started working on, um, you know, on Americans, uh, you know, on, on Eisenhower, Ulysses S. Grant, the Rockefeller, President Reagan, President Carter. I can give you, you know, a huge, amount of um, of hours that I produced and directed and wrote mostly for American experience in at WGBH. 
But you know, quite frankly, I, I always, I amaze myself at how much I would learn about American history, how important everything was and how you, I had the privilege and I was given, you know, of being able to penetrate this culture and to, to learn it and to learn it uh, from the ground up. And then somebody decided that they wanted me to do a show on Fidel Castro. And that presented a whole set of other, a whole other sets of challenge, set of challenges because my distance shortened. I mean, I, I, now it was more personal. There is no doubt that um, whenever I, when I started working on films about Cuba and when I started working on films about Latinos and Latin America, my, my commitment went much deeper. In, in terms, I felt that I had a personal responsibility and at the, you know, to, 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 to create some distance between myself and my passions and at the same time deliver that passion in, in the work. And that is a very difficult piece. I, with Castro, I tried to be, I, you know, I tried to be as objective as I could. And in the end, I think the film was criticized by the left and by the right. So in a, <laughs> I felt that I, I mean, they almost, they almost, I was here in Miami and my executive producer still calls that screening the lynching. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it, there was so much tension in the audience. And yet, you know, um, people began to write to American experience saying how right wing that film was. So in a sense, that was to me the great success of that film, that I could get criticism from both sides. Um, when it came to, I think, my next truly heartfelt piece was Latinos. I don't know if you're familiar with the series that I did for W and um, W Wida in, in Washington, right. uh, Lat Latino Americans. And there, I, I became so passionate about telling the story of Latinos in the United States and the two hours that I did, actually three, I, you know, I was a serious producer and then I had responsibility for two hours and then another one. To me, it was so important that this series established the legitimacy of the Latino presence in the United States. I became obsessed with that. And the film and the first hour did that. And I would have to say that I was truly, that was the thing I felt most passionately about in anything that I'd done. I identified completely with the loss that the Californios and the Nuevo Mexicanos, both native and Spanish, suffered uh, with the expansion of the United States and with Manifest Destiny. I identified completely with the lack of acknowledgement that the enormous contribution that Latinos made to the building of Texas and the building of Los, An of Los Angeles ended up, um, you know, how that was not never truly fully recognized. And, you know, there I, I, I found it very hard to, to, um, to maintain that, that, that distance because here was something that was vital and that was urgent. And, and, I, and I really felt that, that we were doing something that needed to be done. When you're getting that close to a, to a subject matter, do you, do you ever need to take a step back and sort of uh, like look at the project with first, uh, fresh eyes? Or how do you handle that? Oh, you always do. You know, you, if you have the time to do it, you let some time go by. Generally, you don't. It's, you know, it, it, it is... Um, you always wish, I think, I always wish I would go back to my films and redo some of the things in later. But usually you're under such time pressure that, um, you know, particularly when you're working on these high budget um, movies for a television station where the clock is ticking and your editor is, is on overtime and, you know, and the archive is costing you 90 minutes a second, $90 a, a second. And so you, you have to surrender sometimes to those pressures. But in terms of Lesama and in terms of Latinos too, I think what I do 
um, to, to get some distance is you always, if you're a responsible filmmaker, you always make an effort at least to listen and to learn what the other side of the story is. And then you make a decision whether you're going to incorporate that or not. And whether that is in a valid argument that needs to be incorporated into your story, otherwise you're not being true to history. So as a filmmaker, and I know this is not straight to your question, but I'm, uh, as a filmmaker, I think, as a documentary filmmaker, you're always caught between the truth and objectivity. You want to be objective, but you also want to tell the truth. And sometimes the voices that will give you objectivity, they are not telling the truth. And how do you make that choice? How do you then balance, quote unquote, a film having somebody that's telling you, you know, all oh, Latinos really, you know, the, the, the ones that came were, you know, where they, they had no legitimacy anyway, so they were wiped out. And so who cares? How do you incorporate that point of view? without, you know, w w w w without damaging the fundamental truth that you're trying to tell, which is a great injustice was committed here. And that's what I want to talk about. When and, you, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean yeah, to put you off. But, you know, so that is, I think, in, in, in some ways, and, and I'm sure everyone, every documentary producer, every documentary filmmaker probably faces that voice at some point. I take it very seriously. Do you have a voices outside of your inner production circle that you trust? As in, like, if you're doing rough edits of a film yeah. of a project, where you send it out to them to to try to see if if they feel like there's a slant one way or another. Yes, yes. You always put together a board of advisors. I think that if you're conscientious, you include in that board of advisors people who you know do not think exactly alike. And so they will tell you, you've gone too far in this direction, too far in the other direction. Uh, ultimately, you know, I have never worked without an executive producer. Sandy Pedlo from Latino Public Broadcasting was my executive producer this time. And she was rigorous. She was not only rigorous in terms of the projection of the film, you know, the, the, the content of the film, but she was also very, um, very invested in that it become accessible. And I think that was, uh, you know, where she she pressured me the most is to make the film accessible to as many people as as I could because, in the end, you know so much about a subject that you begin to forget how people are not going to understand you unless you really break it down for them. Build, build yeah. it up for them. Yeah. Tell them the story. Yeah. 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 Uh, Dimitri says, "What an amazing experience! Thanks for watching the stream, Dimitri." Um, oh, uh, and then my next, uh, I don't know, we're, we're going to try to keep this short, but when, uh, how much time do you spend? Um, Cause I can imagine in terms of uh, like a documentary like this, where it's both recreated footage, you know, letters, voiceovers and stuff, you know, how long is your first cut? And do you have, and do you trust an editor to just take chunks of footage and get rid of it, and then you trust that oh, you no. see it, or how involved on you're in the editing oh, process? Oh my god, I I'm uh, I'm horrible. You can <laughs> ask me. I, I am famous. <laughs> I'm horrible. I sit with an editor. Basically, I give them a cut. I mean, sometimes I fake, or sometimes it's true that I give them options. Sometimes you give them options because ultimately you don't know best. You might think you know better, but you really don't know best. And an editor brings some some something to a film that will that that helps you see things in a different way. But no, I I cut. I make a paper cut, and uh, and usually what I do is I give editors uh, some a lot more leeway in uh, in 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 the choice of images mm -hmm. and in the choice of. Um, you, so you work you work the opposite way. You give them the rough cut and let them smooth it out for you, right? No, I give them a paper cut and then I okay. to them, and I give them selection. Oh, wow. For example, I will write a script, and you know, and within that script there might be a sequence that has twelve choices of takes. Out of those twelve choices, you end up with three, and it you know their input comes in. In that in that first cut uh, that that I I direct the edit, I think documentaries are really 
you know, basically this type of history documentaries no. are made in the edit room a lot because the choices are can be infinite. What do you what do you include? What do you leave behind? What do you leave out? Uh, how do you go from one sequence to the other? The architecture of a film can be very complex. Where do you start? I mean, your first decision is, where do I start this film? In the case of Lesama, um, of Letters to Eloisa, the decision was, you know, very clear to me. I had to start at a moment where you knew that his sister had left Cuba and that he was very hurt. And then immediately kind of tell the audience, well, why did she leave? And, and so, um, in, 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 some, in some ways, that moment of departure means a lot for your film. In another film, I might have started in the middle of the story where when he gets in trouble politically. But I thought since this was about letters, I needed to know who was the person to whom, you know, who, to whom he was writing these letters and what was his relationship to her and what did it mean that she left and also to get his to get a sense of his poetry and his writing into the film right away so that first first sequence where she walks away and he's relating to her in a letter a dream his mother has contains an enormous amount of information that kind of sets up a lot of what's going to happen in the film you know a lot just from watching that um editors then become very important. I think that as you move on, you know, you walk away from the edit room, you let them work on uh, on what you're doing, depends on the editor. Some editors are stronger, other editors are not. Um, one of my two editors was quite strong. The other one wasn't, you know, was a great editor, but wasn't really as strong. Um, the, the Then you need to rely on, for example, when you put together those um, recreation sequences of what yeah, I was about to ask you, yeah, like how, how do you mix those? That's an editor's job. Yeah. I, you know, I could put together, uh, you know, I, I went with my director of recreation, Maria Bures, my great cinematographer, Tim Crack, whom I brought from London, and to do this in, and, and so we, the images were there, the story was there, but then I needed a superb editor to be able to make those choices. And, and pull it together, continuity, um, you know, pace, all those things then come to bear into the filmic and artistic elements of, of a documentary. So, you know, depends on the documentary, depends on what depends you on. I know, I have, I have trouble letting go and, and, and trust. Oh, man, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I know, we all do. We um, all do. But documentaries, you see, it's easier when you're making a narrative film because you made a lot of the decisions prior to, yeah. to yeah. your production. And, and when you go into the edit room, you already have a clear sense of what you're going to end up with. In documentaries, you just have too many choices, too many choices. No, as, as I always say, you, you, you direct a movie uh, 40 times, once when you write it, once when we shoot it, and then the 38 times that you re-edit it at and the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know, well, you know, it's, but we love it, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing, yeah, like, yeah, there's, right. there's nothing like a fresh timeline laid out and you just start making your cuts and, and, oh, and find, I, finding how things cut together and just replaying something back and being like, oh God, I love how that I love how that, that changes. There's nothing. And it's then like somebody a, looks at it and said, oh. <laughs> and like, and like, whoa, whoa, why'd you use that shot? <laughs> um, why you do that? I why'd you do that know. there? It's usually because I had to. I had no other options, honestly. Well, um, when you um when obviously the subject is you know he's a, a an icon of 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 obviously literature but the fact that you tell the story in the form of letters also seems like an important choice because when's the last time somebody wrote somebody a letter it's also a throwback to an to an older time when nowadays nowadays it would have been long text to his sister right it would right. have been something like my sister just sent me a long ass snapchat you know like is is, is there something to that yeah, as well right. you no know, yes yes there's something wonderful i think letters are unique and they've been literary you know in in literature they are literary that's where we get a lot of our history from that's right and and once you have 
that's what brought me to the subject. I, I came from the letters to the subject. The first thing that I saw was the letters and I thought, oh my God, you know, what an incredible opportunity to tell a, a, a slice of Cuban history. And at the same time, you know, really literally a slice of Cuban history. As I got deeper and deeper into the letters, then I said, oh man, this is a story about a writer who's overwhelmed by history. And this is much deeper than, than I thought to begin with. This is universal. And so that made me even double down on the idea of, of the letters. Um, but I mean, I think people forget that for a long time we had nothing that we had telephone conversations that were lost. We had no emails. We had no Snapchat chat. We had no messages. We had nothing. And all we could hope for is that somebody had recorded something. Now we have a record. We, we can make documentaries. I think we're back into it, the age of people are writing a lot. I have nephews. I have two nephews. One is 22, one is 28. And they're incredibly literate because they have to write every day. They have to write emails, they have to write texts. They don't make grammatical mistakes. They, 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 they have to look at the writing. And I think ultimately this proliferation of writing that we have may not be the same type of writing, but we do have, look when they do these investigations now, they take out somebody's drive, all the emails are there. So yeah. you can, you know, so you can trace a story via those 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 emails and i think people pay attention to, think, to to how they communicate so i think we have kind of in a different way a resurgence of writing as a as a as an element in storytelling i think also like when a lot of people when text messaging started becoming popular were saying like oh i don't why are we going backwards? Why would we go backwards from being able to talk to somebody on a cell phone to now I'm right. having the same conversation, but typing, but I think it's a lot, a little much ado about nothing really, because you're st it's still communication. It's still reaching out. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's always there. I mean, you can always rescue a text and if you don't, so it's somewhere, I mean, we have this idea that there is a cloud out there. No, no, no. There isn't a cloud. There is a big server somewhere. Yeah, it's there just a. You know? It's just yeah. It's yeah, all your info is there. Um, all right. And you don't see it. <laughs> That's why it's a cloud. Okay, so I just have a couple more questions for you, okay. Adrian, and then I'll let you go. Um, um, Listen, I'm really happy that we're talking about uh, about um, um, process here. I I love process. I think okay. process is is so important. And, uh, I, I'm a narrative filmmaker. Um, I always say that in my production company, we don't necessarily make important films, but we make comedies and, and, and stuff like that. And I think it's important to, to, to let people laugh sometimes. Yeah. But my yeah. long term goal as a filmmaker at some point is to do some long form documentaries about subjects that are important to me. I just, you know, it's 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 just, you know, time and time and a place at some point I'll get to it. So I love having conversations with filmmakers well, about processes. The, the first thing you have to have is, is, is a great story. Yeah. And you know it the minute you see it. If you become committed to a story the minute you see it, uh, you know, I mean, stick to it because, it, 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 you know, people think there's a lot of great stories to tell and maybe at times there are. But then at other times, you know, there may not be as great uh, as you think they are, especially if you need to do a long form documentary, your story has to have legs. and And that's why, you know, if if you have um, you know if if you have a story, one of the most timeline documentaries are terrific. You know the documentaries long. You know that uh, that 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 follow a character two to three years. Give yourself some time to let that story develop. And even if it's a story that is mostly in in, in flashback, this person is likely going to change. Uh, when you're telling their story. And I think that personal transformation that very day uh, captures uh, within the time frame of a, of, of, that a film is shot always finds, gives you nuance and gives you, um, g gives you a, a real human sense of, you know, how 
people change and people change their minds and you know we need to accommodate that and comedy we always have yeah. <laughs> I always uh, if we don't laugh we're screwed you know? yeah, absolutely I always felt that you needed to take more care uh, in making a documentary because uh, you know if it's something about that that's ongoing you know I always I always felt like well there's this theory that once you start documenting something you immediately change how it would be responding to to normal day-to-day -day things you know yeah right so so you have to so you have to be careful with that i th also think do you do you well, agree you that, inject that yourself in, you, you inject yourself in the story and you right. think the story will change it for uh for up and coming or for people that want to get into filmmaking do you think that short form documentaries about things around them that are interesting to them is a good oh, yeah. uh entryway i think it's wonderful i think that if if you're if you have um if you have a, a story that you can tell in 12, 14 minutes, go ahead, tell it in 12 to 14 minutes. And then if the story works and you think you've left a lot out, uh, then, you know, then build it up and make it bigger. But don't pass up on a story that's around you because it's not an hour or huge or, and if your means, if you, if you have a short budget and if you have um, another job, and this is what you can do, do it. Absolutely do it. I've seen stuff done in 12, 14 minutes that's magnificent. And every lens has, every story has a lens and every lens is capable of drawing out of the story something magnificent. And you know, and, and you don't wanna bore your audience. You, you wanna, you know, if, if you have a story that's five hours long, then maybe you have an hour documentary. And, right. you know, and so, yes, I absolutely encourage short form. Short form is great. Excellent. And yeah. uh, do you, do you happen to know, um, about, um, back to you, back to the, the letters, um, if he still has family that, that is in Cuba, out of Cuba, what, it, where's the rest of his family now? Oh, his family is here. His sister died. Uh, I am in touch with his nephews. And nieces, and you know, and grand nieces. I spoke with, I speak with them um, all the time. I, um, you know, I um, wanted to be kind of. What can I tell you? I wanted to be. I, 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 I wanted to keep it tight. I wanted to keep it to the two of them, and I wanted to keep it to him. And I wanted to keep her, and that's another reason why that scene is at the open of the film. I wanted to keep her, in a sense, fresh in his own mind as that beautiful sister that left and that he remembers and, and not let her become somebody else in reality while he dreamt of her as she was. So I wanted to keep the fantasy in a sense of Eloisa present and alive in, in his letter writing. And then at the end of the film, if you see when we see her only at the end, when she comes out in the eighties after his death and she all of a sudden, oh my God, here she is in flesh, you know, in reality, this is the real Eloisa. Meanwhile, she is this, the image of her is, I think, what's important for him. And, and so I, I did an interview with his nephew. I didn't use it. And I had actually met Eloisa, and I spoke with her extensively before she died. If she had been alive when this film finally, you know, when I finally started shooting, I might have interviewed her. And then the film would have become a very different film. Yeah, it would have been incredibly very, different. Very different film, and 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 frankly, the, her letters are 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 not of it. Her letters are lost, or at least lost to us. I have not discovered them. She collected the letters that he wrote her, knowing that they were of enormous literary value and historical significance, and donated them to the University of Miami library and where they've been you know preserved and digitized and they're now preserved um <clears throat> but the letters from her to him are gone and i you know god knows if i i probably would have had to interview her and again it would have been a very difficult film and i wanted to keep i wanted to keep 
I want it to. And you're, you're a narrative filmmaker. It would, you want to keep fantasies. You want to keep secrets. You want to. No, it would have. It would have been more like educational, like uh, scientific, than 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 more like you know ephemeral. Yeah. More like more like a yeah, feeling. Like ephemeral. I, I you know beautiful. That you you you, you nail you, you hit that nail on the head. Yeah. It gave it created this ephemeral and and poetic vision of <coughs> of their relationship. I mean, we was so. These are love letters, and and he was writing love letters to this beautiful woman, and so that's you know, and that is true for every love letter, twenty thirty years later. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> what have you been? What, how how have you been keeping yourself busy during during the lockdown? Doing a lot of these? Well, are you been pra- uh, planning your next project? What have you been doing? I've been sort of thinking about my next project. I don't have anything on lock lock you know locked yet, and. Uh, uh, staying healthy, I moved in with my mother. Yeah, excuse me. Salud. Salud. During the, gracias. Uh, during the pandemic, so I've been, you know, I've been swimming a lot. I've been um, moving the film, you know, trying to get the film into festivals and trying to get it distributed. I, you know, I haven't really, you know, that hasn't been so easy. Uh, it, it, it's still sort of, I'm still taking baby steps in that. Um, and... Uh, and mostly thinking about what what to do next. I, you know, I, I need to start um, a new story. I have some ideas, but I don't have anything yet that's chilled enough that I, you know. One of the things that we wanted to talk about, the film um, that is that I had on, in mind was doing something on Miami in 1980 uh, that unites the McDuffie riots, um, uh, the Mariel uh, boat lift, and the anti-bilingual ordinances that were all coming at the same time. You know, I mean, 1980 was a, a a siege change. But then this wonderful filmmaker, local filmmaker, made a film about called Liberty Burning about the McDuffie riots. So I kind of step off that, and I'm letting some time go, and you know, so that I can make a film that is not the repetition of his film, and maybe do something that you know is more digested. Uh, through history in three years. So we'll see what happens. Okay, and then uh, last thing I wanted to ask you just in, in the topic of, of the film would be, I know you, you, you sort of alluded to it a little bit, but how has the perception of, of uh, Zama been in Cuba and in, in Southern Florida now? Is he kind of back to a status that he was, you know, before everything happened to him? Or how do you feel the perception of him is, is changing now? Oh, I, I think Lesama, um you know, Lesama remained an icon of an entire generation of Cubans. I think that Lesama arrived full force in exile in 1980 with the Mariel boat lift because there was a lot of young men there and a lot of them gay and you know writers and and who 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 basically still thought of him as an icon. And the first Mariel, the first literary journal of that generation, was dedicated to Jose Lesama Lima. So in a sense, that what is what brought the Samalima to exile. Reynaldo Arenas was uh, a devoted follower of Jose Le Samalima. You know, he's the protagonist of the Schnabel film um, uh, Before Night Falls. Right. And, and, and Le Sama also became internationally famous. Paradiso was translated into, you know, every conceivable language and it became, he became kind of a, um, a canonic, you know, he became, he, he really did take his place in the pantheon of that Latin American boom, uh, thanks to um, critics, thanks to the other writers of the boom who basically made sure that his work, you know, got the attention that it needed. And then in Cuba, when the 90s rolled around, I think the government began to to reconsider a lot of what had been done in the in the 70s and the 80s, and um, and 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 an opening, a flowering of culture, of, of literature, and everything began to take place. And the rescue of Jose Le Samalima began to take place. They, you know, they decided that Jose Le Samalima, um, you know, they decided to publish Paradiso again. They made him a museum. He, they transformed his house into a museum. He became the subject of multiple. I mean, there is a proliferation of Lesama 
writings now. Everywhere you turn, somebody's writing about Lesama, both in the United States and, and also and also in Cuba. And and um would Lesama, I think the key question that I ask myself about this is, and, and I struggle with this in the film, how much credit, how much emphasis to place on the rescue of Jose Lesama Lima. And I felt in the end that number one, you cannot erase what's been done to a human being. I mean, he died and he was miserable and he um, he had a horrible time of, and he suffered oppression and he suffered loneliness and he, you know, and, 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 and he basically died in a terrible, terrible place. And at the same time, um, you you can restore his place in history fully because if you think of the Latin American boom as a media event, which it was, because all these writers were writing about the same time and all this attention was poured on to them. And Lesama wasn't there. To try to bring him from obscurity and put him back in there is not quite the same. It's not quite the same. So I think it will always remain in some obscurity because of this, uh, you know, people become, you know, your moment is your moment. And if you don't shine when it's your moment, it's gonna be very, very hard to restore you to the place that you would have occupied um, then. So I I, I think this, this is, uh, there's some, you know, there's some things that cannot be recovered. Uh, in, 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 in this rescue of, of Jose Le Samalima. At the same time, I applaud the fact that, you know, uh, he is back as part of the Cuban, as, as, a, as a key, central, probably the most salient intellectual figure of the 20th century in Cuban literature. Um, in, you know, and, 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 and he has been, re, you know, he, he has that place one more time. And I think... Um, as a reference point uh, in in literature, both in Cuba and Latin America, there is no doubt that that has been important. And of course, the Cuban government gave him some some popular exposure when the that film, you know, Strawberry and Chocolate, that was made in the in the in in the nineteen nineties, had Le Samalima as sort of his off stage protagonist, off screen protagonist, um, you know, when the, around the issue of homosexuality. And he has become sort of a homosexual icon as well. And I think that a gay icon, and I think that's very, very good. Because well, if you, if you haven't been able, if you didn't get a chance to watch the movie, it is playing again next Sunday, the 27th at 2.30 p.m. So you guys have one more chance to watch Jose Lesma Lima, Letters to Eloisa. Uh, an incredible documentary. Uh, thank you very much, Adriana, for taking the time to do the Q&A with me today. Uh, any last words for us or for the people that, that what you want them to take out of watching your film? Well, I want to thank you, Luis, for taking this time. I, I have enjoyed this conversation tremendously. And um, I, I want people to walk away from this film with an understanding of how important it is to preserve our freedoms. And I don't mean in the sense of that, that that's being interpreted today, but our true freedoms. And to make sure that the rule of law, that institutions, that all of those things that protect people are respected and cherished. And that we don't ever take them for granted because when they can, you know, they can really hurt when they're not. There. Yeah, absolutely. People really get hurt when you have, you know, um, governments that don't respect the rule of law and don't respect constitutional you know constitutional limits and 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 think that they can shut people down and you know and 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 play with the truth um in in ways that they should not at the same time i i think we need to protect freedom of speech as much as we can um so you know on both ends, I, th I think we need to to be careful how we how we deal with this precious, precious, precious thing that is uh, freedom, that is speech, that is literature, and I I, I like that to be the take the take home point of this. 
So go watch the documentary, get excited about it, and then get up and take some action, right? Well, you know. (laughs) Vote. 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 (laughs) Thank you, Ariana. You said you vote. Vote. All right, right, guys. Thank you for watching. You can watch the movie again next Sunday. We were supposed to do 30 minutes. We did an hour, but it felt like like nothing. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I didn't get to meet you in person. I would have had a lovely time. Oh, I'll I'll reach out to you later. Uh, Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.